Welcome back, hockey fans, to the Neutral Zone on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. This week, we'll be talking about the coaching carousel, the Olympics in China, and fight nights. Fighting in the NHL? Never. Let's go. Welcome back, hockey fans, to the Neutral Zone. I'm your host tonight, Zachary Puplis. Adam Karnick has the evening off. <clears throat> tonight, we're going to be talking about fighting in the NHL. What? And we're going to be talking about <clears throat> some updates in the Olympic hockey and the coaching carousel. Plus, we'll check scores throughout the league from the whole night and more. Ready to get new into it? Ready to get into it? Let's go. This is the Neutral Zone on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. First, we want to thank our sponsors. Background Check International. Businesses, are you looking to background check a new hire? Let Kit Freeman take care of that for you. Kit Fountain has managed Background Check International since 1994, and he's here to help you with the screening process. Contact Kit and let him make the hiring process that much easier. This business is to be used for professional background checks and not for the use of any crime, such as identity theft or any other illegal activity. You can find him on social media um, or his website, uh, as well as Facebook, Background Check International BCI. We want to thank the Southern California Warriors semi-pro football team. The world of semi-pro sports is unlike any other sports organizations. Players pay to play in hopes of so many different outcomes. Whether it's playing, whether it's playing to get filmed to try out for professional teams, big-time colleges, or just playing to stay in shape. No matter what, all semi-pro players have one thing in common, and that's playing for the love of the game. The SoCal Warriors have been on a quest to earn titles and give players second chances since 2017. Whether you're in Southern California or anywhere in the world, give semi-pro sports a chance if you love your sport. You may get that second chance you have been waiting for as an athlete. You can follow them on Twitter at SoCal Warriors on Instagram at Southern California underscore Warriors, or on Facebook, Southern California Warriors. Also, you can get to the channel and follow us on social media, uh, IE Sports Radio, on Twitter at IE Sports Radio, 
Instagram at IE Sports Radio, or on Facebook, IE Sports Radio. You can also follow me on Twitter at the Puplis, or you can follow the show I or at IESR Neutral Zone. All right, let's get into it. Um, L.A. Kings forward Brendan Lemieux was recently suspended five games for biting Ottawa's Brady Kachuk. Lemieux will forfeit $38,750 in salary while under suspension. Kachuk was furious after the incident. Uh, and it was quoted as calling Lemieux's actions, he was quoted as saying, the most gutless thing somebody could ever do. Kids don't even do that anymore. Babies do that. I don't even know what he was thinking. He's just a complete brickhead. He's got nothing up there. Bad guy, bad player, and a joke is what he is. End quote. (laughs) We were talking earlier in the season about rivalries and how a rivalry starts and how how do you foster that? You know, thinking that there'd be might be a natural geographic rivalry with the new Seattle franchise in Vancouver, and yeah, it's stuff like this that can it can spark a rivalry. So who knows? Maybe maybe there'll be a new rivalry between the Kings and the Ottawa Senators. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the article went on to say, twenty-five-year-old. Lemieux is the American-born son of infamous NHL agitator Claude Lemieux. While Kachuk is the son of NHL veteran Keith Kachuk, who racked up himself quite a few penalty minutes, 2,219 penalty minutes in his two-decade-long career. (laughs) Well, sounds like he wasn't really an angel either. (laughs) Don't throw stones, you know. Brendan and Claude have now done something that nobody else ever has. They have a a record now. They've become the very first father and son duo to be suspended for biting in the NHL. Claude's story starts on May 22nd, 1986, following the buzzer of Game 4 of the Stanley Cup Finals. A fight broke out over after Montreal... 1-0 1-0 win over the Calgary Flames as the refs handed out 122 minutes in penalties. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Claude was amongst the mixed as he bit down on Flames Jim Paplinski. Um, this article goes on to say, does biting run in the family? Is it genetic? <laughs> Paplinski received a tetanus shot following the incident and was later quoted as saying, he wasn't aware that the league allowed cannibalism. <laughs> what a quote. You cannot make this stuff up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you felt like the first incident was crazy to begin with, then you hear that his dad did the same thing and they've got a history of, of violence and a history of biting in the family. I mean, <laughs> it just gets crazier and crazier the more you learn about it. <laughs> Truly, sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. Uh, We want to thank Bar Down and ESPN for those great articles. But that's not the only fighting that occurred recently. You know, we're used to fighting in the NHL, fighting in the on the ice. um, You know, other than maybe boxing, it's probably the most violent sport out there. You know, we're used to people getting punched and slammed up against the boards and losing teeth and everything but that's on the ice this next fight occurred in the stands <clears throat> we now turn to the new york post for this story uh at a a fan during the vegas a fan during the vegas golden knights game against the edmonton oilers recently added a completely new twist to the sporting event brawl taking her off her prosthetic leg and using it to hit someone. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) 
in a video posted to Twitter, the woman, as well as others around her, including one fan in, in a Marc Andre Fleury jersey, had turned to the row behind her to engage fans in the scuffle. <clears throat> the woman then reached towards her left knee, ripped off the prosthetic leg, and appeared to swing it towards the other fans. Uh, The woman's arms were covered in the video by a fan standing next to her, so it's unclear if the prosthetic leg actually made contact. (laughs) Oh, my God. Uh, It's just the latest fan fight to circulate on social media. In the past month alone, Dallas Cowboys fans were involved in an altercation with a concession stand worker during their Thanksgiving Day game, while a Titans supporter, Tennessee Titans, uh, was dragged down the SoFi Stadium steps during their Sunday night football victory over the Rams. Uh, in in the said game between the Golden Knights and the Oilers, <clears throat> Golden Knights lost three to two after allowing two goals in the final three minutes of the opening period and never recovered. It was just their third loss in the past nine games, though, and they still sit fourth in the Pacific Division with twenty four points, six points behind first place Edmonton, whose hot start was fueled by wins in nine of their first ten games. Thank you, Connor McDavid, and your video game numbers, and Leon Dragseidel. And uh, Duncan Keith as well. <laughs> but yeah, so again, st- the truth is stranger than fiction sometimes. <laughs> uh, we are going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Sports fans. Do you like teams that are tough, cities that are tougher, and fan bases that are passionate about their teams? How about teams that are historic and stadiums that are iconic? Then you belong in Chicago, and you need to check out Chi Town Weekly. Join me, Adam Kernan, every week as we keep up with all things Chicago sports. Bears, Bulls, Blackhawks, Cubs, White Sox. We'll cover them all, plus more. The Windy City is always buzzing, and we'll keep you up on all the big games and major stories. So tune in to Chi Town Weekly every week right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Rushing waters of the Columbia River, stretching across the Great Cascades, and on IE Sports Radio lives the Northwest Territory Sports Show, hosted by me, Brad Buckingham. On this show, I cover all the great collegiate and professional sports teams that we have here in the Pacific Northwest. Of course, I'm talking about the Seattle Seahawks, Seattle Mariners, Sounders, and even the Seattle Kraken. But I can't forget all of that is good in Oregon either. I got the Trailblazers the Oregon Ducks, the Beavers, even the Timbers, and much, much more. You can listen to the show every Sunday from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern, noon to 1 p.m. Pacific, on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports.
And we're back. This is The Neutral Zone on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. I'm your host, Zachary Puplis. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'll get back to our hockey news here. We've got some news from the coaching carousel. Flyers fire coach Alan Elaine Vigneault, and they lose their ninth straight game. Let's dig into this some more. Um, via Emily Kaplan on ESPN, uh, the slumping Philadelphia Flyers fired coach Elaine Vigneault on Monday. Vigneault was in his third year of a five-year deal that paid him $5 million annually. Uh, news came a day after the Flyers were embarrassed by the Lightning at home 7-1. to one. Oof. Woof. Ouch. <laughs> on Sunday, extending Philadelphia's losing streak to eight games. They are now, oh, uh, as of yesterday, 0-6-2. Oh, uh, the Flyers have the second worst record in the Metropolitan, Metropolitan Division through 23 games at 8. Uh, 8 and 11 and 4. <clears throat> Philadelphia also fired assistant um, Michael Michel Therian, a former NHL head coach himself. Assistant Mike Yo, however, was retained, and he coached the Flyers in their Monday night home game against the Colorado Avalanche. Through a wide ranging search, or though a wide ranging search might begin sooner than later, for now, general manager Chuck Fletcher is setting his sights on the here and now, and that starts with yo. Fletcher's quoted as saying, the focus is not on interviewing people and rushing to hire a head coach. It's to support Mike. End quote. Uh, Though the Flyers showed some spirit on offense with yo looking on from the bench, the end result didn't change Monday. Excuse me. (coughs) Philadelphia fell into a 4-1 hole to the avalanche in the first period, eventually succumbing 7-5. to five. Woo! Wow, that is an offensive game. <laughs> to one of the best teams in the Western Conference. Um, Yo was fired by the St. Louis Blues in November 2018. He had joined the Blues as an assistant in 2016 after five seasons with the Minnesota Wild. Uh, the Wild made the playoffs in three of Yo's four full seasons and he was fired 55 games into 2015-16 season. Uh, He joined a season bench in Philadelphia with Vigneault and Therian, giving the Flyers a rare combination of three on staff with NHL head coaching experience. Wow. Um, Yo was quoted as saying, this is an opportunity for me to prove that I've grown. Uh, Vigneault's history... Uh, he was hired by the Flyers in April 2019, and he joined the organization with 1,216 games of head coaching experience. Vignol, uh previously coached the New York Rangers, Vancouver Canucks, and Montreal Canadiens, and took two of those three clubs to the Stanley Cup Final. <clears throat> he won the Jack Adams Award in 2007 with the Canucks, as well as the league's top coach. Flyers made the playoffs in Vignol's first season, and after seeding the seeding tournament in the postseason bubble in Toronto, Philadelphia landed the number one spot. After a first-round win over the Canadians, though, the Flyers were eliminated in the second round by the New York Islanders. The Flyers missed the playoffs last season, finishing in sixth out of eight teams in their division. <clears throat> uh, this offseason, Philadelphia made significant upgrades, including trading for veterans such as defenseman Ryan Ellis, Forward Cam Atkinson and defenseman uh, Rasmus Ristolainen. Uh, the moves, however, have not translated into success. Ellis and other key Flyers players, such as Kevin Hayes, have battled injuries early. In a news conference last week, Fletcher blamed the team's poor start on injuries. <clears throat> As losses piled up, though, Fletcher clearly felt the problem was more than just a shorthanded roster. Fletcher was quoted as saying, right now, we've lost our way. Wow, it'll be interesting to see what they do. Um, that's quite a fall from grace from being the number one number one seed in the 
in the bubble there two years ago. <clears throat> but, I mean, he's coached three other teams. I'm sure he's going to resurface somewhere else, too. So, we'll see what happens. We'll keep you posted. Any kind of news, you'll find out about it here on the Neutral Zone. Uh, the Canucks also fired their coach. Let's see here. Via ESPN, uh, Kristen Shilton. Uh, the Vancouver Canucks fired coach Travis Green and general manager Jim Benning on Sunday. Also fired were assistant GM John Weisbrot and assistant coach Nolan Baumgartner. Whew, wow, they really cleaned house. Um, signaled a wave of change throughout the struggling franchise. With the team stuck in last place in the Pacific Division, Bruce Boudreau uh, was hired to replace Green. Boudreau is the Canucks' 20th coach. Uh, Canucks chairman Francesco Aquilini said in a statement, First, I want to sincerely sincerely thank Jim, John, Travis, and Nolan for their passion and dedication to the organization and our community. We are grateful for everything they have done for the Canucks during their tenure, and we wish them nothing but success in the future. These are difficult decisions, but we believed we would have a competitive group this year. As a result, I'm extremely disappointed in how the team has performed so far. I'm making these changes because we want to build a team that competes for championships, and it's time for new leadership to help take us there. Scott Walker, 49, was named an assistant coach to Boudreaux. Walker spent four seasons playing right wing for the Canucks from 94 to 98. He previously coached the Ontario Hockey League's Guelph Storm and worked as the Storm's president of hockey operations. Uh, Stan Smile will serve as Vancouver's interim GM, with Ryan Johnson taking on the role of interim assistant GM. The shakeup comes a day after a disheartening home loss in which fans dis- voiced their displeasure with fire betting chance. 58 year old Benning was. 58 <clears throat> year old Benning was known for some solid draft picks and questionable free agent signings over his eight seasons as GM. Green was promoted to Vancouver's bench on April 26th, 2017, after coaching the club's American Hockey League affiliate, the Utica Comets. <clears throat> Despite an impressive run in the NHL playoff bubble of 2020, he was dismissed after 289 games, finishing with a 125, 132, and 32 record. Vancouver made the postseason only once in Green's tenure during the pandemic-shortened 2019-2020 season. But that run was promising. The Canucks advanced to the second round in Edmonton, eventually falling to the Vegas Golden Knights. This season has been abysmal for Vancouver, though, with the Canucks owning the second worst record in the Western Conference at 8, 15, and 2. Last month, Green deflected questions about being on the hot seat amid the growing chorus of disgruntled fans calling for change. I don't listen to the noise, Green told reporters. I only worry about coaching the team. I do understand when people get upset, but it doesn't have an effect on me one way or another. Uh, Shortly after Green made those comments, Benning met with the media, and he didn't give Green a vote of confidence. Benning said, he said at the time, we're looking at everything. We're trying to find solutions to our problems, and Travis and his staff are working hard. Losing is wearing on them like it's wearing on all of us. This is something that I didn't expect to happen after the moves we made this summer, but it's happening and we have to deal with it. After a spring of headlines around his future, Green reached an agreement on a contract extension with the Canucks on May 21st, adding two more years to his deal. But there have been several issues for the Canucks this season, the most glaring of which is their lack of star power, and Green just wasn't able to find the right mix. Star center Elias Peterson, who signed a three-year, $22 million contract in October, has been nearly invisible with just four goals in his first 25 games. Brock Besser led Vancouver in points last season, but he has had just 10 points in 22 games thus far. Even captain Bo Horvat has struggled, producing just 13 points. 
By late November, not even Canucks players were hiding their frustrations any longer. After a 4-1 to loss to the Pittsburgh Penguins, marking Vancouver's seventh defeat in eight games, JT Miller was asked if everyone in the dressing room was still buying in. I don't know, Miller said, sparking another tidal wave of criticism levied against the Canucks underperformance. Coincidentally, it was another 4-1 to loss to the Penguins, Saturday on home ice, that seems to have been the final nail in Green's coffin. As such, the pressure to turn things around quickly under Boudreaux and the new staff will be intense. This opportunity with the Canucks will be Boudreaux's fourth stop as an NHL head coach. Wow, kind of sounds a lot like Elaine Vigneault that we just talked about. Uh, <laughs> Boudreaux has had stints, uh, has had prior stints in the NHL with the Washington Capitals, Anaheim Ducks, and the Minnesota Wild. He was working as an analyst for the NHL Network this past season. Boudreaux was fired by the Wild in February 2020 after a 27, 23, and 7 start to the 1920 season. <clears throat> in all, Boudreaux has coached 984 NHL games with a 567, 302, and 115 record. Boudreaux will be behind the bench, or he was behind the bench Monday night. Uh, when Vancouver played host to the LA Kings. Let's see how that game turned out. Oh my gosh, Vancouver actually won that game. Four to nothing. Whew! <laughs> Good for them. So Boudreaux's first game coaching the Canucks was a four to, four to zero win. <clears throat> Thatcher Demko made 30 saves. Uh, what else? Brock Besser. Brock Besser scored. JT Miller scored. And Garland and Lamico scored. Uh, next up, we got some Olympic news. Uh, Vegas Golden Knights' Robin Leonard turns down Sweden's invite, uh, cites health reasons. Uh, Greg Wyshynski from ESPN reports, um, Vegas Knights' Golden Knights goaltender Robin Leonard has told Sweden he won't accept their invitation to play in the 2022 Winter Olympics. Leonard is the first high-profile NHL player to announce he won't participate in the Beijing Games, which will feature restrictive COVID-19 protocols and potentially lengthy quarantines for those who test positive and exhibit symptoms in China. Leonard, 30 years old, said he made the decision for health reasons and after discussing the situation with his psychiatrist. He made the announcement in a post-game news conference following the Golden Knights' 3-2 victory over the Calgary Flames Sunday night. <clears throat> He was expected to be in the mix for Sweden's Olympic starter with Flames goalie Jacob Markstrom following the retirement of Hen Henrik Lundqvist, longtime New York Rangers goalie, who was their primary goaltender in 2006, 2010, and 2014. I wish him all the best, Leonard says. Um, in a follow-up tweet later Sunday night, Leonard wrote, I'm very disappointed, and it was a tough decision for me as it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Reality is that what has been said about how it's going to be is not ideal for my mental health. My well-being has to come first, and being locked down and not knowing what happens if you test positive is too much of a risk for me. Sweden will have a great team, and Markstrom is the best. Hope people understand. Uh, following the Jack Eichel situation, Leonard has been one of the NHL's leading voices on the mental health consideration of players. He was critical of some aspects of the league's playoff bubble that it created in 2020 due to the pandemic. Uh, he was also critical of the league's restrictions on vaccinated players last season, saying, we need to start making the mental health important as well in this situation. Uh, currently, the NHL intends to send its players to the 2022 Winter Games, after skipping the 2018 games in South Korea, 
The league and the players collectively bargained to have NHL participation in the next two winter games. However, the NHL has until January 10th to opt out without any financial penalties should COVID-19 conditions worsen or otherwise pose a threat to the health and safety of its players. Um, next, earlier this season, we talked about the possibility of China um, not being one of the teams in the Olympic hockey tournament. Um, as the host nation, they get an automatic berth into the tournament, regardless of their world ranking. They are, in terms of world ranking, they are subpar compared to everybody else. Um, so there were concerns about that, whether they would be able to play up at the same level as all of the other all the other countries. Um, so uh, this was on ESPN. Associated Press says that China will take part in the men's hockey tournament at the upcoming Winter Olympics in Beijing after initial concerns that the team would be embarrassed on home ice against NHL-level competition. The International Ice Hockey Federation confirmed China's participation Tuesday, avoiding what would have been an unprecedented removal of a host country's team for performance reasons. The IIHF spent recent weeks reviewing players' eligibility to represent China. Players making up the Chinese national team played two recent test games against Russian opponents with international officials watching closely. The team playing as Continental Hockey League club Kunlun Red Star lost 4-1 to to Avangard Omsk and 5-4 to in overtime to Amur Khabarovsk, getting outshot 77-43 to in the two games combined. Kunlun coach Ivano Zanata said the games were evidence his team meets Olympic standards. Definitely not second to a Norway or Denmark or Latvia were equal to those countries, Zanata said. Then, today in the last game, they proved they have the character and the ability and they have the right to participate in their own Olympics. The IIHF agreed, even though Kunlun has lost 29 of 36 Continental Hockey League games this season. Wow. And China is ranked 32nd in the world. <clears throat> uh, the hope is that an influx of international players allows China to not get blown out in group play games against the U.S., Canada, and Germany. Leading scorers Spencer Fu and Brendan Yip and top defenseman Ryan Sprawl are Canadian and starting goaltender Jeremy Smith is American, though there is still some uncertainty about who will be eligible to play in Beijing. The IIHF allows players to naturalize and represent a country if they've played there for at least two years. <clears throat> it's not clear if there were eligibility concerns for some naturalized players because the pandemic forced Kunlun out of China to a Moscow suburb in early 2020. Athletes are required to be citizens of a country to participate in the Olympics. After being awarded the 2022 Olympics in 2015, China hired big-name coaches from overseas and invested in a youth academy with the aim of developing a hometown team in that time. That failed, but China will still get to play on home ice in February. The attention now turns to NHL participation, which was agreed to with the caveat that if the league, that the league and Players Association could pull out if pandemic conditions worsen. Again, as we stated earlier, the deadline is January 10th. Um, if a significant amount amount of NHL games are postponed for coronavirus related reasons withdrawing is an option because the two and a half week Olympic break would be needed for rescheduling purposes Uh, overall, uh, regarding the NHL, COVID, and the Olympics, um, the first game of the 2022 Winter Olympics men's hockey tournament is scheduled for February 9th. It's still not certain that NHL players will be competing in the Beijing Games. Um, via ESPN, here's a look at 
issues, concerns, and challenges facing the NHL and the players just two months away from the Olympics as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to loom over everything. Uh, when does the NHL have to make a final call about the Olympics? The IOC and the IIHF uh, have talked with the NHL, and the NHL has until January 10th to opt out with any penalties. Uh, again, as a reminder, the Olympics are scheduled to begin on February 3rd. The NHL still could technically opt out later than that, but there would be financial consequences. Since everyone is waiting, is watching their finances right now, the NHL, still recouping from missed revenue during the pandemic, has maintained a flat salary cap. The expectation is that we'll know definitively on January 10th or before. Uh, what's the latest you're hearing about the decision? Uh, Emily Kaplan states, NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman never wanted to send players to the 2022 Olympics. NHL players had participated in a string of five straight Olympics before the league decided not to send players to the 2018 Games in Pyeongchang. Bettman feels that there isn't enough upside for the league. Besides the disruption of the schedule, uh, there's the risk of players getting injured and unfavorable licensing and, mar- licensing and marketing agreements with the IOC and the IAHF. Bettman and many NHL owners don't think the juice is worth the squeeze. That said, they made an agreement with the players during the last round of collective bargaining talks to allow them to go. And Bettman, in good faith, intends to see that through. The only way the league office will pull out of the Olympics at this point is that if there is significant schedule disruption due to COVID-19 that will make it impossible to finish out the season in time. In other words, if the league feels it absolutely needs that current three-week break to reschedule games, as of right now, we're not there. A rising scenario is the players themselves do not want to go to the Olympics and ask to pull out, such as Robin Leonard. Olympic participation has always been incredibly important to players. The opportunity to represent their country on that stage, on the world stage, is a childhood dream for so many. (laughs) Wow, yeah, for sure. (laughs) However, given the current climate, Anxiety about, anxiety about the virus, restrictive protocols, and a non-traditional athlete village experience, plus the fear of having to quarantine in China for three weeks after testing positive, players are starting to show some trepidation. The NHL Players Association is in constant communication with its members, gauging their comfort level. As of now, the concerns are not enough to reverse course, but it's something that continues to evolve and could change over the coming weeks. All right, so what happens if the NHL decides not to go? Emily Kaplan says, According to sources, the NHL has created a shadow schedule that features just a one-week break instead of a three-week break, should it, just, should it decide not to go to the Olympics. It would cause a lot of headaches. Building availability is low, with concerts and other sporting events in full swing, so there isn't much wiggle room. Also, players have been banking on a three-week break. Many players not on Olympic shortlists look forward to the Olympic break as a much-needed in-season vacation, and many of them have planned tropical getaways, which they would have to cancel. If NHL players do not go, the Olympic hockey tournament will still go on. As was the case for the 2018 Olympics, which NHL players did not participate in, Team USA would be filled with college players, professionals playing overseas, and even a few former NHL players. Brian Giannata, at age 39, served as the U.S. captain in Pyeongchang. The NHL coaches who were appointed as heads of Team USA, Mike Sullivan, and uh, Team Canada, John Cooper, also would not attend, and the federations would name replacements. Uh, do most of the players still want to go? Christian Shilton of ESPN says, um, well, absolutely the players want to go to the Olympics. They fought to get that opportunity back in the latest collective bargaining agreement. And of course, 
the desire to represent individual countries remains strong. <clears throat> uh, one player was quoted as saying, it's certainly fair to say it was an important issue for the guys. There are some guys that never got to go, and this may be the last one for them. However, there is an increasing concern about what traveling to and staying in Beijing could mean, both over the short and the long term. For some younger players who believe there will be another chance for them to play at another Olympics down the road, negatives might outweigh the positives about going this year. <clears throat> but some veteran players who know these games might be their last opportunity sound more open to going, to still going, despite the risks. The bottom line is feelings are fluid. The more information players receive, you know, about potential quarantines, possibility of getting stuck in China, the repercussions of a positive test while overseas, etc., the more things can change. The players we talk to decline to discuss concerns about human rights violations or other political concerns about the country. <clears throat> There's always the family side of things to consider, too. There are younger guys that may just be starting families who have the, those considerations, and they might think they have another shot to go in a few years, another player source said. But how much pressure do guys feel to represent their country? Uh, have players opted out yet? Have players opted out yet? Uh, Greg Wyshynski states, Robin Leonard of the Vegas Golden Knights became the first high-profile player to reveal that he'd rejected an invitation to represent his country in the Beijing games, like we were just talking about. Um, after Vegas defeated Calgary Flames Sunday, he was asked about vying for the starting goaltender job for Team Sweden with Calgary's Jacob Markstrom. Leonard said he turned down an invitation um, to play in the Winter Games. He made the decision for health reasons and after discussing the situation with a psychiatrist. Um, Leonard has been a vocal critic of NHL COVID policies in the past. Um, yeah, like we've already discussed. Uh, all right, let's take a quick break and we will be back. Are you a Minnesota sports fan? If you are, you should join me, AJ, on my Thursday night podcast called Frozen Takes with AJ on IU Sports Radio. I talk about all things Minnesota sports from the Vikings to Lynx basketball. Every week I talk about the good and the bad of sports in the land of the frozen lakes. Join me Thursday nights at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time for your Minnesota sports show on IU Sports Radio. Your direct feed for all of the sports. college football and do you want to hear a college football show dedicated to all this college football including junior college and the triple ccaa and the njcaa the naia and the ncaa including division three division two 
Division One Double A in the FCS and Division One Single A in the FBS. Well, then look no further. Join myself, Larry B, and my colleagues, Mr. H Town Blake, Blake Henley, and Mr. Christian Espinoza, each week during the college football season for the latest in college football on Three and Out College Edition, right here on IE Sports Radio, your directory for all that is sports. What's up sports fans? Are you looking for the latest on Northern California sports? Then take a trip out west with me, your host, Gina G, on Reppin' the NorCal Sports, right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. I'll be bringing it to you all the way live every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. And it's always a packed show. I'll bring you everything. Dynastic 49ers. The bite of the San Jose Sharks. Torture of the San Francisco Giants. The Golden State Warriors that we still believe. Then take you across the bay to the rise and grind of the Oakland A's. I've got you covered on college ball from the Cal Bears to the Stanford Cardinal, so that no matter what, repping the NorCal sports is always repping the Bay. So if you bleed red and gold, or you're looking to keep an eye out west in them thar hills, don't miss me, Gina G, on repping the NorCal sports. Catch me every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, and I'll have your fandom repped harder than a trio of Defenders Garden Stephen Curry before his buzzer beater is Gucci. segment and then we'll be out of here for the night a uh, little bit more about NHL and COVID and the Olympics <clears throat> uh, we talked about Leonard opting out already um, some teams have already postponed some games due to COVID outbreaks um, there's no set number of COVID-19 cases that triggers a team shutdown. Everything's done on a case-by-case basis. There are several factors involved in making the decision to postpone games. And ultimately, that call comes from the medical groups of the league, the Players Association, and the individual clubs. Uh, one of the biggest factors in the process is how teams are controlling the spread. We've seen clubs like the San Jose Sharks and Pittsburgh Penguins lose several players to illness but not be shut down, while the Ottawa Senators and New York Islanders have had games postponed. A difference is that in the latter two cases, players continue to get sick one after the other for a significant stretch, as opposed to the other instances where a bulk of impacted players tested positive within a few days of each other, and the teams were better able to control the virus from there. NHL's concern, beyond just the health and safety of everyone involved, is competitive balance as well. So if an outbreak reaches a point where a team can't reasonably be expected to perform at a high level, Postponing games has to be taken into consideration. 
Um, another thing that could be impacted by COVID-19 is the NHL All-Star Weekend. Uh, NHL All-Star Weekend is scheduled for February 4th and 5th in Las Vegas, with the skills competition set for Friday and the All-Star Game scheduled for Saturday. Both events will be held at T-Mobile Arena, although the NHL is planning on having some skills competition events take place outside on the Vegas Strip. The league intends to have as normal an All-Star Weekend as possible, with parties for VIPs and its annual Fan Fest, which will be set up inside the city's convention center. Currently, NHL plans to abide by the local COVID-19 protocols for events. T-Mobile Arena does not require a proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test for entrance uh, for Vegas Golden Knights home games. But following the state of Nevada's directive, masks are required for fans attending games there. Guests under two years old are not required to wear masks. The NHL and the Player Association are in talks about protocols for players who travel to Las Vegas for the All-Star Game specifically those who will be headed to Beijing immediately afterward for the Olympics. Olympic athletes must provide proof of negative COVID-19 test results before their departure for China and will be tested upon arrival at Beijing Capital International Airport. While nothing has been decided formally, the expectation is that Olympic athletes will have stricter protocols than non-Olympians at the All-Star Weekend, from housing in separate hotels to restrictions on participation in public events. Uh, wow. There's a lot <laughs> to break down here. Okay, we got two more sections here. Um, so what happens if a player gets COVID-19 at the Olympics? Athletes who are confirmed, who have a confirmed positive test during the Beijing Games will not be allowed to compete. If they are symptomatic, they will be taken to a designated hospital for treatment. If they are asymptomatic, they will be asked to stay in an isolation facility. The hospital does not sound like a fun time. The location... (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Sounds just like we're we're dealing with in the U.S. Uh, The location and length of the isolation period will be determined by the Chinese health authorities, depending on the severity of symptoms and... or severity and symptoms of the infection. Athletes will not be able to go outside the building. They can be visited by team representatives for safeguarding checks during designated hours. There will be English-speaking personnel and mental health professionals on hand to assist. Athletes can be discharged from the hospital when their body temperature returns to normal for three consecutive days. Their respiratory symptoms improve significantly, including documented improvement through lung imaging. They have two consecutive negative COVID tests within 24 hours of each other and they exhibit no other COVID-19 symptoms. Asymptomatic athletes will be discharged after two consecutive negative COVID tests at least 24 hours apart if they exhibit no other COVID symptoms. Uh, Those athletes discharged from isolation facilities will face increased COVID-19 protocols, the same ones into which those who are considered close contacts will be placed. A close contact is someone who spent 15 minutes or more within one meter, uh, six feet, well, three and a little bit more, (laughs) Um, and unmasked with someone who tested positive for COVID-19. The increased protocols for those, these two groups include quarantining in a single room and a much higher frequency of testing, uh, temperature checks twice a day, and COVID-19 tests every 12 hours for seven consecutive days. If all those tests are negative, the individuals may move back to a regular testing regimen. But there's not only concern from players about catching COVID-19, well, the Olympics in general, but also when they might catch it. Um, Let's see here. So... (laughs) <laughs> this is this is assuming a lot, but if everything breaks right, who are the favorites for the 2022 men's ice hockey tournament for the Olympics? Um, Greg Wyshynski says, probably the team that has either Sidney Crosby or Connor McDavid on its second line. <laughs> Canada will be loaded as usual with a slew of players who will be appearing in the games for the first time, like Connor McDavid, 
Mitchell Marner, Nathan McKinnon, Braden Point, Mark Stone, and Kale McCarr. The Canadians won gold in 2010 and 2014, the last two times the NHL participated in the Winter Olympics. Canada could run it back with a goalie who won in Sochi, 34-year-old Carey Price, who is expected to compete with Jordan Bennington for the starter spot. The crease is one area where Team USA might have the edge on its arch rivals. Connor Hellebuck, John Gibson, Jack Campbell, and Thatcher Demko make up the deepest position. Well, now that's funny. (laughs) One of the two Canadian goalies up for it play in the U.S., and at least two of the four of the Team USA goalies play in Canada. (laughs) Ironic. Uh, They make up the deepest position on the American side. Uh, It's the first Olympics for Austin Matthews, but it's expected fellow star center Jack Eichel could miss the games due to his rehab from neck surgery. Uh, The biggest changer for the U.S. is on defense, where there's an influx of young standouts making their Olympic debuts. Adam Fox, Charlie McAvoy, Quinn Hughes, Jacob Slavin, Zach Wierenski, and Seth Jones are among those in the mix. The U.S. and Canada are in the same group as Leon Dreisaitl and the Germans, as well as China's national team, at least for now, as the IIHF mulls swapping China out for Norway, lest we see the host nation embarrassed in group play. Uh, the Russian Olympic Committee won gold in the 2018 Winter Games as the Olympic athletes from Russia, as you might recall, the World Anti-Doping Agency ruled that banned Russian athletes um, from competing under their nation's name and flag for four years. Uh, Alex Ovechkin and company will be in the same group as the Czech Republic, Switzerland, and Denmark. If the Russian Olympic Committee can play well enough defensively and or get stellar goaltending from one of its lead options in that it's certainly a metal threat Um, rivals sweden and finland are in the other group along with slovakia and latvia Uh, the Finns are going to have some offensive firepower up front alexander barkov miko rantanen and sebastian aho are among their forwards but could they see a changing of the guard in goal from tucker rask to jose saros uh, speaking of changing the guard, the last time Sweden had NHL players in the Olympics, it had Sedin Twins and Henrik Zetterberg up front and Hedrick Lundqvist in goal. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's quite a while. <laughs> uh, in China, it could be the team of Elias Peterson with Jacob Markstrom likely taking over in goal. Early wagering favorites for the goal for the gold without rosters having been selected are Canada, um, minus 125, Team USA, plus 350, and Sweden, plus 500 as of September. Okay, that just about does it for us for tonight's show. Let's do a, a wrap-up of the scores around the league tonight, and then we'll call it a night. Uh, in games that have gone final tonight, Rangers beat the Blackhawks 6-2, to two. Hurricanes beat the Jets 4-2. to two. Blues beat the Panthers 4-3 to three in overtime. Uh, Ducks beat the Sabres 2 to nothing. Preds beat the Red Wings 5-2. to two. Oh. Uh, Both my team and Karnick's team lost. Shoot. <laughs> Islanders beat the Senators 5-3. to three. Lightning beat the Canadians 3-2. to two. Maple Leafs beat the Blue Jackets 5-4. to four. And there's two games still ongoing. Um, Flames are leading the Sharks 2-1 to one at the end of the first. And it uh, looks like Wild are going to probably win this one. They're winning 4-1 to one with 4 minutes and 38 seconds left in the third. So it looks like they'll probably hold on to win that one. Barring, you know, an empty, or barring, yeah, <laughs> barring the Oilers pulling their goalie and scoring with an extra player and a miracle and all that yeah but i mean i guess they do have Connor mcdavid so never put it past them (laughs) all right well uh that'll do it for me uh this has been the neutral zone on ie sports radio 
your direct feed for all that is sports. I'm your host, Zachary Poplis. Adam Karnick was off tonight. And, yeah, we will see you next week. Stay out of the penalty box. Light the lamp. All that jazz.